Uh, I would like to clarify up front that there are no sparse autoencoders in this talk. <laughs> if you're just here for the SAEs, I will not be offended if you exit now. But language models model multitudes. What does that mean? I'm not even sure. Uh, so to give you a little background context on why I'm doing this work, I have a really long-term research in, uh, interest in deception and manipulation from models. Um, I feel like many doomed worlds involve models being strategically deceptive and or manipulative. Uh, so I think if we can find a way to robustly detect those when they emerge, we're much better off. It's maybe not a complete solution to alignment, but I think it helps a lot. Um, so what does a model have to be capable of in order to deceive and manipulate well? Um, I would say that one neglected aspect of that is that it has to have a good model of its listener and its listener's beliefs. If I want to deceive you, right, then I have to think about what you're going to buy, right? Like if I try to tell you that you're in China right now, not only will you not believe me, or on Mars, not only will you not believe me, but um, you'll lose trust in me as a speaker, right? And that trust is hard to get back. So I think this is a very important part of the picture here. Um, so I looked at a lot of text. Um, this is uh, from a data set from OkCupid from 2012. Um, I used it because people have written text and um, it is paired with ground truth data about them. Uh, if we had time, we could look through this and try to make guesses about the person who wrote this stuff. Maybe we could guess their gender. Maybe we could guess their education level, right? Maybe not. It, it really varies. Um, on the other hand, I looked at another data set, which is high school students writing essays, right? I think this is a very hard case. Um, it's very hard to tell very much about the author of this. And so what I was interested in is what do current state-of-the-art LLMs, how good are they at this? Uh, and the answer is they're really freaking good. Um, so across the bottom here, we're seeing um, the model's confidence. Um, and here we're seeing the actual correctness per bucket. It's very noisy in the middle because there's um, not very much data. But in the large majority of cases where the model is quite confident, it is nearly always correct. Um, it attains overall 90% correctness on the first data set you saw and 80% on the second. Uh, and this is really with very little like optimization to do this. This is, this is just really fairly naively prompting the model to guess. Um, I looked at gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity. Um, right? These are just the things I happen to have ground truth data for. Uh, I also looked at various things that I don't have ground truth. I will say anecdotally is it extremely good at detecting people's politics very quickly. Um, so is this bad? Right? Like, there's a lot of cases where it's helpful to have these models, these general purpose models, understand us. Right? Like, um, if we want them to do a good job explaining things to us, it helps a lot if they kind of know what we already understand, what we don't, what our comprehension level is. On the other hand, is it okay if they can guess our sexual fetishes? Some people would say yes, some people would say no. If they can figure out your most blackmailable secret, that seems less good, especially in worlds where these models are deceptive, uh, and strategically so. Um, so where am I going next with this? Um, there are a number of directions. Uh, I've got kind of a proof of concept web app where you can put text in and it'll tell you what it, what it thinks about who you are. Uh, I have not released this publicly. I'm debating doing so. It feels like it potentially plays into a bunch of culture war stuff, but it could help people rethink maybe they're, whether they're comfortable with this uh, and we could have some public conversation about that. Uh, I think it's very important to come up with a metric for this, uh, and the reason is that I think these demographics are just really the tip of the iceberg. Most of what the model learns about you is much more sort of subtle and nuanced. It's just harder to measure. So I'm working on kind of a more robust information theoretic metric for this. Um, there's a lot of very interesting stuff. Right here we're looking at um, like the author of a text. That's somewhat distinct from the notion of, of the user writing text, right? Which I think is a sort of a special role that emerges probably during like RLHF and equivalent. And then the dual of that special role is, is the self and what the model 
um, believes about itself, which I think is also very important and interesting. Um, I think there are a lot of th kind of theory of mind based experiments that we can use to sort of get at those special roles. Uh, and I'm also starting to use interpretability tools in order to um, try to get a better understanding of this uh, internally because, right, in a world where these models are strategically deceptive, we can't necessarily just ask them what they understand and get a good answer. Uh, that is it for the moment. I would like to thank Jessica Rumbelow and Laura Vaughn and my streammates and a lot of the brilliant people in this cohort. I've been so mind blown by the talks this morning and um, I'm really sick to have had a lot of great discussions with a lot of you. That's it. And I have a little time for questions. I went through a ton of stuff really fast and I barely touched on any of it. Garrett. So um, one concern I would have when looking at the metrics that you have is was this in the training data? So was that in the, tra the training data? Great question. I would sort of expect the OKCupid okay data set to be the persuade corpus, which is the essays, is, is really pretty new. And I don't think it is. Although, um, like, it's right near the cutoff date, so a little bit hard to say, but it seems le a lot less likely. Dashiell. Uh, have you checked any, like, smaller models to, like, try and get a sense of scaling logs and, like, what? Uh... Not yet, but that seems really important. Yeah, it's definitely on my plate. Just. Ah, it does actually do very well. Like, for example, in the OKCupid okay data, right, there are a fair number of cases where someone uses a word that you could use to sort of overtly deduce their, their gender. Um, I've done some work to strip those out, uh, and that does drop its performance, but only from 90% to 88%. I think it's largely depending here on sort of very implicit cues. No, and I think that current models may already be superhuman, which I think would be a really interesting result because one argument I've heard for why we shouldn't worry about LLMs is an argument that I don't believe in general, right? Which is that, um, oh, they're learning on human text, therefore they'll never be better than human at anything meaningful. And this would be a really interesting counterexample to that. Wait, there was somebody who didn't ask a question yet. This is GPT 3.5 Turbo Instruct, um, which I can no longer use because OpenAI just changed their, uh, their um, thing. And if you want to blame someone, blame these people. <laughs> their paper made OpenAI change their model. Um, uh, but I do need, I, I think um, when we get into like author versus user, that's where the base model versus uh, chat model gets really important and interesting. Mm. I have not yet. And like I said, I'm sort of just starting to um, approach this with interpretability tools. Uh, and that seems like a really good use of those. Anyone else? I have one minute. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Yeah, I think that's super interesting. Um, Yvonne suggested a really interesting experiment, which was um, for gender. Um, one thing that will shift it, uh, uh, Rocket kindly sent me a list of, that he had found on the internet of like words disproportionately most known by men and women. Um, the, I compared uh, two of those, that one of the most male, disproportionately male known words is howitzer. And uh, one of the most, <laughs> disproportionately female known words is peplum, uh, which is a particular way to cut a skirt. Um, and that will definitely shift its, its beliefs. Yvonne's idea, which I thought was super interesting, is um, have a man write about 
disproportionately female topics and vice versa and see how it does. I haven't had time to do that yet, but I want to. No. You know, that's a, I, um, I did a little kind of trivial anecdotal one with that. Um, but no, let's just say no, and it's a really cool idea. Was that time? Yeah, I've sort of thought about that, but what a horrible world that is, right? Like where we, all the uniqueness of each of our voices is like stripped away in order to be safe to say things in public. So no, I don't know. I don't have any other ideas at this point. So I think that's it. <laughs>